Veni Creator Spiritus, Nelter Tuorum Visitam, in Before I begin our meditation, I suppose you would like to know who I am. I do not usually like to announce who I am because I am a simple missionary priest. <coughs> and I'm Father John Cordero, 
and I used to belong to it, a religious order dedicated to St. Joseph. So we begin our meditation with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going to meditate precisely on the Eucharistic celebration of the Holy Mass and the institution of the priesthood of Christ. <coughs> Christ has called us to follow him and the lay people have to follow Christ through the priesthood of Christ. That means through your priests. And that's why we must always have respect and honor for our priests, whether you like them or not. Okay. If you don't like me, I don't care. I love Jesus, and that's the most important thing. And we must do all for the honor and glory of God, so that Christ may be glorified. That's the same Paul teaches us through his letters. It's Christ that we must give glory. And when I preach, I preach, preach him, Christ crucified, not myself as a person, but as a priest of Christ, I must be able to preach to you what Christ wants me to, the will of God. During this week, we had a tribunal for the seminarians, and in it, we had meditated especially on the institution of the Holy Eucharist, or rather the suffering servant, as he is reflected in the institution of the Eucharist. The suffering service, servant of Christ. And as we progressed in our meditation, we saw that you cannot separate Christ from our traditional Catholic faith. It, it, it uh, does not make sense. We, then we'd have no faith. And that's why we must keep our faith pure and without any type of diminution or any type of moral digression or separation from the laws of Christ, of God, our Father, and the Holy Ghost. So the center of our Mass is the priesthood of Christ. And the sacrifice of Christ is in the Holy Mass. And Christ is the victim, Christ is not only the oblation, which means one who is to be sacrificed, but he is also <clears throat> the suffering servant. So what happens during the Mass? Again, I have to repeat that Calvary is brought on to the scene of the altar in a very dramatic way. The presence of Christ is brought about only and exclusively through the priesthood of Christ. Only a validly ordained priest can bring Christ on our altar and change that substance of bread into the body of Christ and the substance of wine into the blood of Christ. And that, in a very technical term, is called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. That means a, a dramatic and miraculous and mystic change takes place. And it's so wonderful 
and so mysterious and so profound, we cannot understand it because it is so divine. And I gave the students one word to remember. If they do remember now, they'll know that it is a gift. And that gift is the, in the Latin word, dona, and that is also mentioned in the sacrifice of the Mass. Heg dona, heg munava, heg santa sacrificia. This holy gift of God that the priest says over the oblation, which means oblation means the offering of Christ at the altar, at the hankichitor. Hankichitor, when, when the priest puts his hands over the chalice and over the uh, host, that's the hankichitor. And if you don't know that, then you're rather ignorant, traditional Catholic. <clears throat> you must know your mass. And you must have the mind of Christ. What's in your mind when you come to Mass? Are you lazy and sleepy and dreary? <laughs> then you're not excited about the Mass. You're dull, dumb, and foolish. You come up out of your lethargy and your tepidity and come and know the mind of Christ. And I would say, well, Father, you're being kind of harsh. Of course I am, because we do not appreciate this gift of God. That word I wanted to tell you was of God's gift to you. It's called gratuitousness. Yes. And they know, well, the few that are here know, and they shook their heads, yes, they know. And they are good people because they want to become one with Christ. I, I don't like somebody coming in and out. And we should not. We have to give ourselves totally to Christ or go away and go by yourself. <clears throat> so accepting the mind of Christ is accepting our faith in its totality. You can't say, well, um, I'll accept this doctrine, I'll, I'll accept this moral teaching, but I can't accept the other or who is the priest to tell me what to do? And if you have that mentality, you're not of Christ. You have to change your ideas and attitudes to make them conform with Christ's attitude. And that applies to all of us, even to the priesthood. Because then the priest himself would betray his own priesthood and the person of Christ. And this great gift of God, I want to uh, let you know that our appreciation for it should be whole and entire and sincere. As I said, you have to give yourself totally to Christ. If you really want to follow Christ, follow me, he said. Because this suffering servant, which is the fulfillment of um, the Old Testament, that Christ gave his life for us so that we can be freed of our own sin and the results of sin, that he opens up the gates of heaven for us, and now we are able to receive sanctifying grace through the wonderful and mysterious gift of God in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. As I said, only the priest can 
pronounce those words of our traditional Catholic faith. <clears throat> this is my body and this is my blood. Those few words are the miraculous event that occurs on our altar. And I want you to now meditate on the promise. First of all, we have the prelude to the Holy Mass in St. John's Gospel in chapter 6. And again, I, I mentioned to the seminaries, if they have time, if they're always so busy, to go and pick up your Bible, a nice big Bible, and take out the Vulgate, not the other translations of, of modern era, but the old traditional translation, which I have, is the, the old Vulgate. Go to chapter 6, and here we'll see the wonderful promise Christ has left us. Unfortunately, <clears throat> when our Lord, after he um, multiplied the, the bread and the fishes, multiplication of loaves and fishes, recall that they wanted to make him king because he performed this great miracle, but he went away and fled from them because, of course, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's what we're striving for, the kingdom of God in our eternal kingdom in heaven. And, well, at, right after this event, what happens is our Lord went someplace else and he disappears from their sight. And strangely enough, he appears on the other side of Lake Tiberias in, in Galilee, Galilee and goes into Capernaum. And <clears throat> there he castigates these people that followed him afterwards because they only wanted material bread. And listen to this in chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. But first of all, he, he wants to do what God wills. What is the will of God? And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what is the will of God for you? And me too. I mean, when I say you, I imply that I'm also included. Because we all belong to this mystical body of Christ. We're all one together. Yet on different elevations, of course. And different uh, works that we have to do. Because I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And the will of my Father that sent me is this, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have life everlasting. That's a promise. And I will raise him up on the last day. And then what happens? The Jews murmur. Uh, they don't like what our Lord is, is saying. And there are many today who do not like what I'm going to say today on this special Holy Thursday. And they don't believe in it. They can't believe that this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. They don't believe because they said, well, I know this man. We know his family. How can he come from the Father when he has a family? <coughs> and then they, they quote scripture, just like the devil quoted scripture. You know, with the temp when the temptations that our, our Lord had uh, in the in the in the desert, <clears throat> well, here the Jews <laughs> imitate a devilish scheme to dishonor our Lord. And it, here in verse forty-five, it says, "It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone that hath heard the, of the Father." and have learned, cometh to me. And so that's why they murmured, because they said that he can't
cannot come from the Father because the Father is God. And then <clears throat> the Jews also object because our Lord becomes so familiar with the title of uh, God. He uses the word Father, which is a very um, common term for an earthly father. And then he thinks that, you know, connected with this idea, then he, he blasphemes. <coughs> but then our Lord goes on to say in verse 48, I am the bread of life. And he retreat, repeats that three times. <coughs> I am the bread of life in verse 48 and in verse 51 and in verse um, 50, oh, wait a minute, yeah, 51 and the other verse, 59. Now listen to this, pay attention, because this is what really disturbed the Jews at that time, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And continuing with that, your fathers did eat manna in the desert and are dead. And our Lord knew the scriptures because he quoted from the book of Exodus in chapter 16, verse 13. The manna of the desert, that was something that came down from heaven and fed the Jews in exile, you know, on the, in the exodus from Egypt. Now he, he's referring to himself, this is the bread come down from heaven, that if any man eat of it, he may not die. And then he quotes again this other quote uh, that I initially began with, I am the living bread. He's alive and well, which came down from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And they could not understand it. And still, all through the centuries, there have been many Catholics and the early Christians who could not understand it either. And some rejected them from the very beginning. And this rejection begins right here when even those people who were fed with the bread, the earthly bread that Jesus performed in, uh, when he was preaching to them, and he, he multiplied the, the bread and the fishes precisely because he loved them and he said very tenderly they, they are here for a couple of days and they are weary, they need to eat. And, and the disciples, uh, as you know, didn't know what to do. They said, we only have a few uh, loaves of bread and fish, and then he multiplied them. So you see the tenderness and the thoughtfulness of our Lord. He wants to feed the people, and now he's going to feed them spiritual food. Oh, it's fine when he gave them that bread, <laughs> and they thought they would see many more miracles. But our Lord didn't want that. He wanted them to strive for the spiritual bread. And once we look at the Holy Mass as the true spiritual bread, but yet the physical true presence of Christ, and we are fed by the spiritual miracle, then we have come a long way. And then we have come to accept and proclaim Christ as our true Redeemer and the true bread of Christ. And then in um, verse 53, they, they question him and they say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus says again, amen, amen, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Then you'll be like a dead person, like a zombie that just walks around in a, in a body but has no spiritual liveliness and no sanctifying grace. 
And fortunately, we do have this great gift. We do have the true bread of life. We do have the sacramental presence of Christ. Now, let me ask you, please, listen closely. What consists of that transformation or transubstantiation of Christ on the altar? There are four principles that you should realize how Christ is present in the Eucharist. How is he present? Body, blood, soul, and divinity. The highest progression is what? Divinity. You have a divine savior at the holy sacrifice of the mass when at the consecration the host is raised on high and the chalice is raised on high. There you have the divine effectuation of the true presence of Christ. How? Pay attention, don't fall asleep. Body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bow your heads in humble adoration. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. And I will raise him up on the last day. So we have the promise of a resurrection. And that's our Easter mystery, our Paschal mystery. That's a better term. I know in, in Italy we don't have the word for Easter. We say Pasqua. That comes from Paschal, our Paschal mystery, as I told the, the seminarians and in our retreat. So this is a Paschal mystery that we celebrate during the Mass. Four, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And here is how we become closely attached to our Lord and become one with him. And that's how we join in the priesthood of Christ when we receive him in Holy Communion. Because here he tells us again in this prelude of his real presence and his coming to us to be united with us. In verse 57 of chapter 6 of St. John, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Abides means dwells. He's living within me now. He's substantially united with me in this Eucharistic presence. And I in him. And then in verse 59 again he repeats himself. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and died. He that eats this bread shall live forever. And these things he said, teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And therefore what happens? Verse 61. Many, therefore, of his disciples, hearing it said, this saying is too hard for us. They couldn't accept it. And there were many, even today, that cannot accept it. And many today express this rejection through their actions and through what they celebrate in their own terms and by their own authority. Because they cannot accept the fullness of God's gift to us his gratuitousness to us, his love for us, and this great gift to us. And many of his disciples left him. So don't you leave, our Lord. Stay with the holy Roman Catholic traditional faith in all its purity, in its primary essential antiquity, in its glory 
and as we honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this holy sacrifice of the Mass, that is what our priesthood is all about. To give you these refreshing, life-giving waters of the sacramental life, and the primary life-giving water is through the Holy Eucharist. And after this, many of this, his disciples went back and walked no more with him. But you won't do, follow him. Because that's the only salvation that you will have. And then finally, Simon Peter answered him when Jesus told him, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And this is the same Peter that uh, rejected our Lord when he betrayed him and said, I don't know him. And once you say that, then you're lost. But thank God Simon Peter recollected himself and did not reject our Lord totally. It seemed like, you know, Satan was tempting him. He came back to our Lord when our Lord was betrayed and in the garden here again in Gethsemane, from uh, Gethsemane when our Lord was returning and was arrested, returning to Pilate. Peter saw our Lord and our Lord gave him a glance and then he began to cry. And that was Peter's sorrowful position. But yet we know that Peter in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16, verse 16, Peter announced that, um, well, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God son of the living God the Father. And then he betrays our Lord. And then he comes back to our Lord with his tears. And then after the resurrection, what happens? What happens is that our Lord again appear, uh, appears to the, his disciples in three times. Because St. Peter, of course you remember, denied that he knew Christ three times to the women who were there at uh, um, warming themselves by the fire in that Garden of Gethsemane. And here, three times, Peter says, yes, Lord, I love thee. And then finally, in great sorrow, but great love for our Lord, then he says, Lord, you know that I love thee. And our Lord says, feed my sheep. And this is what we do when we have the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We're feeding you. We're feeding you as I mentioned, the bread of life. This is the bread of life that came down from heaven and appreciate it. And don't let anyone deter you from your determination to remain as traditional Catholic souls and remain true to your faith in all its purity and its essence. Because as our Lord said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And these are important uh, uh, elements of our traditional Catholic faith to follow Jesus Christ. We have to know more about our Lord. We have to study more. And that's why it's so important to not only listen to sermons, but also do spiritual reading. And the spiritual reading is not only for seminarians and, and for um, you know those who are uh, teaching in schools or 
and in the academic world. No, it's for all of us to learn who is this Christ. Now, Simon Peter said, Thou art the Son of the living God. That's part of the knowledge of Christ. And the incarnate word of God is made flesh in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There's, again, another place where you know who is this Jesus? Who is he? Do you really know our Lord? No, you don't. Uh, you have to keep studying. You have to keep praying. You have to keep um, putting all these wonderful ideas of who is Christ in your mind so that you can live the Christ. That's what St. Paul said. I live. No, not I, but Christ lives in me. So, is Christ living in you? Yes, he is. Of course he is. Because you have sanctifying grace. You go to confession, you get your souls purified, you come out, you have the fullness of sanctifying grace, then you go to Holy Mass, and you receive our Lord. Always remember, who is this Lord that you're receiving? Remember, who is he? That's another part of knowing who he is. He is body and blood, soul and divinity. And remember, you're receiving God. I had a neighbor once, and he was a little boy about five years old, and he uh, he didn't know how to uh, address me, so his father said, oh, well, you have to be very respectful because he is like God. And so whenever he, he would greet me, he would say, Father God. It was a, a cute expression of that, that little boy that uh, he wanted to know more about God. They were not Catholic, they were Protestant. But then they moved away, so I couldn't do any uh, conversion there. And I wonder what happened to him now. And finally, as I said before, we have to know the mind of Christ. And what is the mind of Christ? It's the will of God that we should know him and not be so self-centered. And so that applies also to us. We must also be like Christ, be Christ-like, and imitate Christ. That's another good book, The Imitation of Christ. If you get your hands on the book, or go to the library and, and check it out, and read it, and you'll be inspired by it. Many of the uh, items in that book, because here is where we learn more about Christ through reading, especially the Bible. There's much more in the Bible about Christ. And the only the only thing I wanted to mention was which I I didn't know how long I was supposed to talk. No, it was in chapter two of Saint Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is very important because it indicates Saint Paul's attitude towards Christ and how he respected the divinity of Christ. Listen to this, chapter 2 of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. For let this mind be in you, your mind, your brain, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So you see how he demonstrates that Christ is equal with God. And this is also in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel. <laughs> when he says, the word was made flesh. The word, the verbum day, the word of God, is who? Is Christ. So that's, again, another part of your knowledge. 
This is the Christ that was made flesh. And this is the same Christ that left his Father and the Holy Ghost to come and take on human flesh. Isn't that marvelous? It's astounding. And sometimes I trip on my words because I can hardly pronounce them because I'm astounded by this great miracle of love and the giving of God the Father of his divine Son. Now what happens? But emptied himself, that is, now Christ empties himself of his uni unique essence of the God the Father, the unity with God the Father, and what happens? He takes the form of a servant. Now he's just a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and in habit found as man. And he humbled himself, become obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross, that is, to the will of God his Father, so that we can have this freedom to enter into heaven. Otherwise, there would be no everlasting life, there would be no uh, seeing God the Father, we would just be dead, as it were, just for all eternity, nothing. But God, in his love, loves us so much that now he wants us to have life and enjoyment and pleasure in heaven. And for which cause God has exalted him, because now Christ is doing the will of his Father. And that's what we must do, and follow the laws of our holy Roman Catholic Church, and do what God wants you to do. And you know what he wants you to do. He wants you to be good Christians. For that is the name of Jesus, or oh, pardon me, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That is shahol. Shahol is the, the uh, Aramaic word for the, the darkness of the dead underneath. And that every tongue, and your tongue that, uh, if you don't have a tongue, you can't talk and express your words. And that every tongue, every tongue, should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Now, what happens when you receive the Holy Eucharist? You receive the glory of God. You can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't feel it, but it's there spiritually through sanctifying grace. Can you see what I'm talking about? Wherefore, my dearly beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more now in my absence, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. Now, Christ is not present here uh, as he is in heaven because he can't be. His glory is so magnificent that if we do see his, the beatific vision, we can't live because it's too pleasurable, it's, it's too uh, brilliant. But he's still present and he's still with us and that's why we still have to keep working for our salvation and thank God for all the sacraments that he has given us. And thank God that you know, we do have particularly the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And I always thank God. You could say, with the whole Roman Catholic Church, Deo Gratias, And now we have paused, I just pause just a moment so that you can reflect on the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ that you should always do the will of God, and he's always inviting you to the Holy Mass. Unfortunately, some of us become very lazy, and then tepidity enters into your human life and your daily duties, and also the diminishing of your attitude toward the real presence, don't let that happen because you'll be going down the slippery slope 
of perdition eventually, then you'll get lazy in your spiritual life. Get to come and visit the hidden Jesus as often as you can. That's what Francesco Marto, one of the young boys who was 11 years old when he died, but he wanted to go to heaven. That's what he said when the children wanted him to play with him. He says, no, I must go to visit the hidden Jesus. And he ran to the chapel. He was only a little boy. Well, not little, but he was 10 years old at that time. That's what I read. And that's what we have to do. And read good books, too. Not only to yourself, but for your children. And always remember what our Lord told the women who were weeping over him. Weep not for me, but for yourself and for your children. And that weeping means that you have to work for your salvation and cry if they depart from the true way to life and salvation. And the only way is the Eucharistic way, the way of Christ. And with this, I will give you my blessing, the blessing of the priesthood of Christ. Auditorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Domini Claudio Sione Meum. Domino Sovetscum. Paremos benedicio de omnipotentis pacis et fili. Espiritus Sancti descendus super vos et mania semper. Amen.